Hey everyone, just wanted to give you a heads up that this podcast kind of took a turn in the middle of recording, so we decided to break it into two different parts. Part one will be project life cycles and how they've changed over the years, and part two will be platform management and some of the issues that arise with it. Enjoy. We'll pass it back and forth like you said. So welcome everybody, anyone who's been listening so far. Sorry about the technical difficulties, but we're getting it figured out now. Uh, Hi Mike. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> yeah, so maybe not so much for back and forth today. <laughs> Ryan's gonna love to edit this video. <laughs> um, so today I wanted to talk about project life cycles and working on um, a project with multiple platforms. Essentially, we did a focus group uh, a couple weeks ago now where we talked about development teams using multiple pro- platforms or products in a single uh, project and how that can be difficult for managers and developers to jump around from place to place and then admins to jump around and give permissions for, to place to place. So I kind of wanted to start with, um, from a high level, how do main project flows, method, meth- wow, how do main project flow methodologies differ today in a DevOps driven area versus the past. All right. So, um, so yeah, one of the things that I wanted to focus on, uh, instead of just sort of de- deciding to talk about the difference between the two pro or the two, I should say more than two, um, main project methodologies is yeah. How it, how it differs between, uh, in the in the current era versus uh, you know the way things were probably about 10 15 years ago maybe even 20 years ago um, primarily due to the the influx of DevOps tools that are out there and project management tools and things like that so your primary methodologies are usually uh, variations of agile or waterfall me- um, workflows and so you have like you have waterfall you've got modified waterfall you've got different types of agile workflows where you've got like scrum um, and, and all sorts of, you know, different derivatives of that, where it basically breaks down to, um, you know, a, a waterfall methodology really is uh, a full uh, deliverable from like a, a design or information architecture standpoint gets passed off into um, so, well, I, let's start from the beginning. You'd have like a discovery phase, right? Um, and then you actually spec out the project. You'd do some wireframes. You pass that into, into uh, design, and then that gets passed into development. And then development develop, you know, creates it, passes it into quality assurance, and that gets passed over then into uh, once it goes live to a systems administrator and maintenance. And then that gets passed on to a marketing team and a maintenance team, um, and that's really sort of just uh, that's why they call it waterfall. It just sort of like flows downward one direction. Uh, you finish one task. You when it's when it hits the end of that milestone, um, you get a sign off before you move on to the next. In an agile wa- water uh, agile uh, workflow, rather, there's a lot of feedback loops. So you're talking about building things in a much more micro scale. So your feature based development. Um, is uh is usually done through a scrum method and that'll be like weekly sprints so rather than like waiting for the end of like an eight month eight to ten month development timeline every single week you've got a a goal that's shared by a number of different resources and involved there and then they build out that resource and there's a feedback loop where there's debugging that moves on to the next sprint and you know every week someone on that team is working on something it's not like once design is done, they move on to another project, and now the designs are in the development hands. You know, these resources are regularly collaborating, collaborating on a on a recurring feedback loop. And so, um, and those are your sort of high level, you know, differences between your waterfall and agile type methodologies. And in the current um, day and age, where you've got a lot of DevOps tools, it actually uh, impacts that agile workflow pretty significantly. So in the waterfall workflow, your DevOps tools don't really come into play in your earlier stages. The design team has no need for them. Um, 
the development team obviously has some need for them uh, for DevOps tools during the development um, life cycle. But the majority of the DevOps tools that they're going to run into um, won't actually come into play until later on in the project development cycle where it's like ready to go live. So if you wanted to include, um, you know, like distributed caching solutions is like, you know, like if you wanted to look at um, uh, uh, different performance um, enhancers like, like Hadoop or um, Cloudflare or Memcached or, uh, you know, any variety of, of available sort of like services or DevOps tools and middleware that are out there. Um, a lot of those don't come into play until late in the life cycle. So as far as the waterfall project life cycle is concerned, the earlier stages are not really very affected. It'll affect towards the end and then the maintenance stages. The agile water, uh, meth method, on the other hand, is affected pretty significantly because of the constant feedback loop. So once you've hit that MVP and you've completed the first iteration and you've got something that's now on a production environment, whether or not it's actually being publicized or not, um, you're having to regularly touch base with those DevOps tools. And so uh, if you're using like um, a task runner for uh, compiling and compressing your code, uh, you're regularly running those. And we talked about this briefly in our conversation about caching, where we talked about like um, that you have to regularly uh, clear the cache um, for something like Magento, or like you have to use, uh, you know, versioning for your um, compressed and minified asset files and things like that. Um, you're going to have to do that over and over and over and over and over and over every time that these things get changed. And so that really greatly affects the 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 um, agile workflow uh, because you're having to update these things constantly uh, several times a week every time that these features are being developed and for each individual sprint and uh, and it doesn't you know just it's not just about performance enhancing tools and it's not just about um, you know different like task runners and, and things like that uh, maybe even middleware or uh, uh, um, vendor libraries and things like that that you would use during the development life cycle. It's also things that are uh, supporting um, the, the way that websites are hosted and the way that w websites are deployed these days, um, you know, whether that's uh, managing several different branches. W like we talked about, again, with version control, your, there's a lot more at play in managing different feature-based branches in a Git repository than there are in a waterfall workflow where you've got the full specs and you could just build out the whole thing on one single branch if you really wanted to, depending upon the number of resources that you have involved. Um, you know, you could always merge their data together. Uh, but, you know, ultimately the, the agile workflow really demands a greater, especially, a, you know, for, if you're doing a feature-based agile workflow, it demands a greater deal of attention um, on those performance-based items because they're regularly updated, on version control management software, which are, which are all DevOps tools like GitHub and Bitbucket and things like that, um, project uh, management systems like Jira and issue tracking, you know, managing your backlog and managing your boards and things like that. That's all greatly affected uh, you know, the introduction and in, in the sort of like um, prevalence of, de of DevOps in today's climate, uh, it greatly impacts agile workflow. It obviously it impacts waterfall, but it, it's certainly more impactful, I think, to agile. And, uh, you know, and that also goes for hosting platforms, if it's Azure, AWS, um, you know, wherever it is that you're hosting these things. There are a lot of these like APIs now that you can run to run deployment cycles and things like that. Um, and those need to be more regularly interacted with in an agile workflow as well. So from that, um, do you see that specific platforms or services are involved in either one of those methodologies? Whereas like, does Waterfall typically use one service or platform versus an, an agile uses this version of this or in back, you know what I'm trying to say? Back and forth. Uh, like, you mean like 
is there one method that uses a tool that doesn't exist in another method? Not necessarily exist, but uh, is one methodology more prevalent to use a tool than another? How's that? I, I, I don't know that I would. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it depends upon the, the project. I can't think of any reason why there would be one methodology that, that uses that's uses a particular service more often than, than another. Okay, just curious. Um, I mean, if I think of something, I'll, I'll certainly bring it up. But it, it'll, it'll happen like with five minutes left. <laughs> yeah, but I, you know, it's not really, it's just a, you know, the difference in methodology is really just a matter of like what order of, of execution. I mean, there are some, there are some tools that are built for certain methodologies, but the, of the ones that I've discussed so far, yeah, nothing comes to mind. Okay. Um, next question I had was, um, what methodology and platforms slash services do we use here at Arcane? Okay, so um, we do project management with uh, Jira. Uh, we've used other systems too. Like, I mean, we've managed projects in everything from like in tickets to like uh, spreadsheets and you know it's just the, the more rudimentary um, formats but you know I've used smart sheets before and I've used clatters in before we generally use Jira um, for project management and you know like I, we talked about versioning you know we'll use Bitbucket or GitHub for um, version control uh, you know we work with for anyone who works with who's seen, who's seen our cloud um, services um, offerings out there. We work with AWS a lot. We work with Azure a lot. Um, Google Cloud Compute is a, another service that we work with. Um, we've worked with Rackspace, but you know, they're, they're, that's not really as much of a platform as it is a service provider. But each of those service providers like AWS and Azure and Google Cloud Compute, they have services that support their product. Um, and AWS in particular has like a variety of different services like uh, S, you know, Amazon SES, which is, um, which Microsoft sort of doesn't really have their own version of. They use SendGrid, or at least SendGrid is available within their storefront. Um, and SendGrid's like, you know, a, a mail service. So you can uh, basically do a pass through um, for ensuring that your emails are not being flagged by spam from, you know, application mailers and things like that. Um, so we'll use. So, so all, all those uh, services that they have, you know, like SES, they've got Elastic um, IP, they've got Elastic Cloud Compute, they've, they've got um, well, or Elastic Search, uh, they've got um, Lambda, uh, different EBS volumes and different sort of EC2 type instances and all sorts of different um, options that are configurable there. And the service that they, they've got an API service and they've also got a GUI um, for the all these different services that they offer. Um, so to the point that it's not really much of a, it's not really simply a hosting platform anymore. Now it's kind of like a service that offers you different performance-based needs. Like if you need like a, a GPU heavy instance versus like a memory or, or a CPU optimized instance or a general um, purpose instance and things like that, you've got more control over how that's being used. You know, just the other day, Aldo and I were discussing about um, you know, we were attaching a, a virtual um, disk for uh, a client in Azure and discussing like, oh, they're giving us the option to decide whether we, or not we want the virtualized disk to be built off of a, an SSD or, or, a, or a hard drive. And in a, the thought, it just hadn't even originally occurred to me like to, to even bother thinking about it because most hosting platforms in the past, you don't really get to, chick, to, to pick that, you know? Um, so it's sort of, no longer just about like find me space and I'll host it there and make sure there's enough memory and, and CPU. Um, they've really converted hosting platforms into being more of a DevOps tool. And so we do use, like I said, we use those hosting platforms and um, I would consider those as being sort of DevOps tools. And, uh, you know, I talked about PMS, I talked about um, versioning. And then, uh, you know, as far as test runners are concerned, a lot of the frameworks we work with, like Laravel, has its own minification process, um, but we do use Gulp, we do use Grunt, uh, or have used it. Um, I know a lot of people out there use like different communication platforms like Slack or HipChat. Um, 
you know, you hear a lot about that. Um, and so that's, you know, that, that's in a nutshell, like what it is that we use. Um, but, you know, there are other other tools that we use too, like monitoring services and Nagios um, we use. Um, you know, there are, there are a ton of different like um, uh, vulnerability testing softwares and, um, you know, intrusion detection softwares out there that, that could easily uh, uh, qualify as being a DevOps tool. Um, you know, a lot of the more popular ones that you hear about are like going to be, um, like you're going to hear Docker mentioned quite a bit, Vagrant, um, I guess Nagios counts as one of those as, as well. And uh, yeah, we use a lot of the more popular ones, but um, there's also, there are also a ton of tools that we don't really ever get the chance to use, and nor do we really want to just, you know, involve them for no good reason. Um, we use Composer as well. Um, that's a pretty good one for managing uh, vendor libraries, dependencies on, on frameworks. So I think that pretty much answers the gist of what you're looking for. Just, just out of curiosity, uh, what tool would you say is the best bang for the buck for us? What what tool? It would it sounds like Jira from talking to you and Aldo and stuff like that. What tool do you think we utilize the most and does the most for us for the price? Ah, uh, man, that's a pretty that's a pretty loaded question because it. <laughs> I mean, it's apples and oranges. By the way, I think you're, you, it might be your cord that's loose if you want to try to jiggle it and see. Um, I, I'm, I'm listening right now, so I can see if I can hear you. While you're doing that, um, I'll try to answer your question. But yeah, that's a super loaded question because they're, they all do different things. I mean, um, well, it, it also well, sounds like they're starting to integrate themselves, right? To, to, to do more than what they actually originally did. Would you agree? Uh, you mean as far as like AWS and Azure and stuff are concerned? Yeah, I, I would take issue with the word, the general word "they," because I, if you're asking specifically, like, are hosting platforms doing more than they used to? The answer is yes, but are DevOps tools in general doing more than they used to. Uh, as a as a whole, I would say that DevOps, the DevOps uh, category, does more than what used to exist prior to it. I mean, DevOps is still relatively new. I mean, the purpose of introducing those is to create opportunities to do things that didn't weren't previously discussed or, you know didn't previously exist in the project life cycles to, to that. And, and there's like, you know, of course we're, we're doing more, but DevOps tools in general are not intended to do a wide uh, range of things individually. You know, they're, they're really targeted at specific um, needs. So like, you know, uh, distributed caching in general is targeted at performance. You know, you're, you're do you're, you're not, it's not reaching into out there and doing things outside of that, um, out of that need, you know, the, the existence of no SQL databases, um, you know, the introduction of that, you know, paired with relational databases is primarily for performance purposes. It's not like going out there and doing something that's other that, that sits outside of that realm on, and then I guess like, you know, version control software, you know, there's, there, it, there are definitely more options than there used to be as far as like branch management and commit messaging and things like that. But it's not, it's not like in the way that hosting providers are altering their service to provide greater options for what it is that they're, they're doing. Um, if that answers your yeah, question. No, absolutely. So I just wanted to talk about our focus group that we did a few weeks ago now. Uh, we tried to learn a little bit more about the project uh, life cycles for some other companies and organizations. And we found some pretty interesting things. Um, is there anything you'd like to say about it before I kind of went into the data of it all? Uh, as far as the focus group that we did? Mm.
No, not really. Um, so I just I wanted. Like yeah, no, that's okay. I just wanted to talk about um, some interesting points that I thought uh, we. So just to give some background, we had uh, eleven organizations represented in the focus group that we did. What was that about three weeks ago now? Three, yeah, four, like three, four weeks ago. Um, and some of the questions I wanted to just pull out and get your opinion on is, uh, one of the ones we asked was, do you think organizations use too many applica applications for project workflow? Out of the 11, uh, eight of them said yes. So this is kind of what you're talking about in the sense that they use, everyone's been using a lot of applications to do very specific things. In the rare case of AWS and Azure, they're starting to meddle and get into other areas, but like you mentioned, a database is still just going to be a database, so a repository is still going to be a repository. Um, you're, you're not getting a lot of cross-functionality between tools. That's kind of the point I was trying to make. Mm -hmm. um, the next one out of the 11 organizations represented, 10 of the organizations indicated that they use at least four different products. So of the um, so the first part, eight said that they used too many. And then secondly, out of the 11, 10 said they use at least four. So four being, I mean, to me, doesn't seem like that much, but can you kind of shed some light on how maybe four products in a, in a, in a project's lifestyle might be a little bit too much for somebody? I don't think that four is necessarily too much. You don't think? No, I mean, I... I, I I don't know. I mean, it's, it's really up to, it de de depends upon your own. I mean, it's all about your own perspective. Uh, you know, that there's ultimately when you're looking at the data, the question is like, if eight out of 10 people think that their organization is using too many um, tools, then what we can, we can determine from that is just that the number of tools that are being introduced right now it's just too much well is that different than the number of tools people are using versus the number of tools that are being introduced well i mean so you know one of the questions that um i guess to your question earlier if there's anything i wanted to go over one of the questions that i wanted to go over was sort of how um how the current landscape differs from how it used to be the project life, what the project life cycle used to be, um, which you really really didn't get the chance to, to to dive into. And so, just to put it into perspective, like DevOps tools didn't really exist. I mean, they're to a degree. I mean, if you want to call version control DevOps, uh, then yeah, I mean, there were version controls uh, tools out there, but these are all developing as a result of um, yeah, we should probably actually turn these up a little bit since we're not standing mm -hmm. near them. Um, these are all a result of more modern day uh, developments. Um, you know, like there were plenty of ways for people to communicate when they were in the office with one another. Uh, and there were plenty of sort of like chat messenger features out there before Slack and HipChat came around and all you know google hangouts and skype and all that and so if you want to call that a, a tool i mean that definitely is a tool that's part of the project life cycle that was introduced um that didn't didn't really need to exist earlier in earlier stages of development um and then you know as far as like the other tools are concerned like uh, uh, version control software has kind of always been you know around in some shape or form um but branch management was inter introduced didn't really you know wasn't a, wasn't as much of a thing in, in earlier um version control in fact if you were like um if you were a developer who was just in, in being introduced to uh to develop um web development through like editing your files in some sort of like localized IDE and then uploading it through FTP. You had a system called like, it was a check-in, check-out system where you checked out a file. It's almost like checking out a book in the library. 
Um, and like a lot of, I, I mean, you might even see some of those legacy check-in, check-out systems on existing FTP clients, um, or even in like IDEs like Dreamweaver, if you're using something like that. Um, not that I would recommend it. Uh, and and so those are those are all like newly introduced features um, that because there was there, they didn't exist, there was just less to manage. I mean, if you didn't have to manage a, a, a ticket management system, or you know, if you didn't have to manage uh, uh, different remote resources, you didn't need to have like a, a chat feature that allowed you to communicate with people in groups like that, like in Slack and what whatnot. And if you didn't, you know, I guess it, I, part of it comes with the advent of sort of like of um, of uh, remote work. In, yeah, remote workplaces, whether it's a, through a vendor or if it's an internal like resource um, on your team that's over in, in working remotely, that introduces all sorts of things. Like you need to be able to track their time to see if they're actually doing what they need to be doing and to build clients by the hour. You need to be able to like, so that's a, requires a time tracking system. You know, you need to be able to communicate with them outside of the office, which requires like a chat function. You need to be able to assign them tasks um, that, you know, you know, a lot of in-house ad, uh, de agile development teams, they use an actual board, the, the concept of like, of a task board and a backlog that you see in, in, in um, Jira is a derivative of an actual physical action. They used to have a board and they'd take sticky notes and just stick them on there. And people still do that today, but you have to have everyone in the office together to be doing that. So as jobs have sort of become more remote, you've had to introduce all of these different tools to the project um, life cycle. Hey everyone, it's me again. Just like I said earlier in the podcast, this conversation started to turn towards platform management. So we decided that it was enough content to make into a second podcast. So we'll be on the lookout for that one to be dropping in the next few weeks. Thanks for listening. Mm -hmm.